to start, I'll just give an update on the performance. There is a presentation which some of you may have, so this is slide two. Uh, performance calendar year to date, uh, we're ahead of benchmark. And in absolute terms, EAI is down only 4.5%. So that was as of the end of April. Over that same time, the ASX 200 was down over 17%. So we're pleased that we're ahead of benchmark and also pleased that, you know, in terms of our investors, we, we offered an investment which uh, performed better than what investors would have gotten domestically. Um, in the last year, we've generated over 500 basis points of alpha. So I'm pleased with that performance. We generated positive alpha in up markets and in down markets. The most current NTA is 111.45, and the share price is at 95. So it, we are still trading at a discount, um, and we can discuss in Q&A what we're doing to address that discount. Importantly, we do have a fully frank dividend profit reserve of 5.3 cents. And when there's many companies in Australia that are uh, deferring or you know suspending or cutting their dividends, we think that that's important. That's almost two years of, of dividends um, that are already in the bag. And month to date in May, we are having a decent month this month. This month, we've generated over 100 basis points of alpha um, as of yesterday. So that's a brief snapshot of, of performance. If you go to the next slide, I'll just give um, a couple of comments on, on why we've um, outperformed calendar year to date, because it has been just incredibly volatile. Uh, COVID in Asia started sort of before everywhere else. So even by the end of January, we were, were changing the portfolio and increasing cash and doing things to um, address COVID outbreak in China. So it's been a bit of a long haul. There's lots of volatility in there. So I'll just talk about where our performances come from and then four reasons why I remain cautious. I'm at almost 20% um, cash right now, and there's a couple of key reasons for that. So in terms of the outperformance, um, this environment has been well suited to our strategy. We, as you recall, we're high growth, high quality, and large cap bias. And particularly during March, when things were selling off very aggressively, um, to be in high quality and large cap was, was the right place to be. And surprisingly, a lot of people have said to us over the last five years, yes, growth, you know, this is a growth environment and growth is great, but when we get a big market sell off, growth is going to underperform quite significantly because it's high PE and people will rotate into cheap value stocks. And that clearly has not happened at all. Um, I think that this, this um, you know, has, has really been a bit of a death knell for, for value investing the last two days notwithstanding. Um, and so our high growth, particularly our tech stocks, have, have been helpful in the last few months. Um, when COVID first broke out in China, we broke the portfolio into three buckets. One was stocks that would be directly negatively impacted. So these were things that were related with travel or uh, retail. The second thing was, was stocks that had gone up a lot and were high beta, and we just wanted to take some profits in it. And the third bucket was stocks that could potentially benefit from COVID. This, in this bucket, it was mostly stay-at-home tech, like Tencent, JD, Alibaba, um, Meituan, um, sort of these stocks. And those have done very well. We have about eight stocks out of the 29 in the portfolio or at or near all-time highs. So that's been that's been a good allocation. Um, FIFO for, for COVID, so first in, first out. A lot of North Asia countries went first into COVID, so they've come out first, and that has, has um, influenced our country allocation. As many of you know, we have very strong ESG criteria. And so in March, when the oil price fell so dramatically, we had no upstream energy exposure. We had some exposure to Reliance in India, but that's a conglomerate. So that was um, a source of alpha generation. And then I have been managing the portfolio very actively, particularly the cash balance. It's ranged anywhere between 7% and 20% in the last three months. So those are, that's where our performance has come from, and we're, we're hopeful that we can continue that for the rest of 2020. Um, the reasons why I remain cautious going forward, there's four reasons, and I'll, I'll go through it in the following slides. Um, very briefly, if you have, um, you can go through it in more detail uh, on your own. But, the reason I remain cautious is one is economic reopening um, and the risk of a second wave, particularly in countries like the U.S., where the number of daily new cases is still very high. So in the U.S., it's about 20,000. Valuation and technicals, diminishing returns to policy action, and deterioration in U.S.-China relations. Um, this is an update on coronavirus and, and why we are very cognizant of potential second waves and what economic reopening means. So this, this normal curve we've been tracking for months now, and at the beginning, all the countries were on the left-hand side. Now you can see most countries are on the right-hand side. Um, India is the only main country that we invest in that's still on the left-hand side of the curve. So that's definitely a positive, and that's obviously one of the reasons why markets are where they are now. But we are watching second waves um, quite, quite closely, um, particularly, as I said, you can see from the chart on the right-hand side in countries where the, the daily case count is still very high, but despite that, economies are, are opening. 
the lesson that we've learned from China is that um, supply actually recovers faster than demand. So China, from our anecdotal evidence and, and certain surveys, um, you know, supply is back up to 90, 95% post-COVID, um, whereas demand is still around 65, 70%. So we're watching this in, in different economies. And um, we're also just watching, actually, we'll transition to the next page. One of the main things about um, about economic reopening is that a lot of the fiscal stimulus that has been part of the, the epidemic will start to be withdrawn and we'll um, see what that does due to actual health financial stress. Anyway, um, the second reason is valuation and technicals. So valuation and technicals are not attractive right now. Um, as you know, global markets have had a very sharp recovery since March 23rd, uh, sort of the fastest in history. So um, as of uh, not yesterday, but the day before when I did this presentation, the NASDAQ was actually up almost 8% for the year. s and was only down around 8%, and MCI World was only down around 12%. So as some of you know, I spent a lot of my career at Oak Tree Capital, and I still follow very closely what Howard Barnes says. He was on CNBC a few weeks ago, and his comment was, at that time, the S&P was only down around 15%. And he said, you know, when I look around the world, it feels like the world is more than 15% screwed up. And I really, it's a, it's a very... Um, you know, non-technical, I look around and talk to our companies, um, you know, they're definitely more than 12% than screwed up. The world seems more than 12% screwed up. So um, in terms of PE valuations, um, not attractive because you can't actually tell what earnings are for a lot of companies in the world, um, less so for, for tech companies in Asia, but for a lot of other companies, there's still very little earnings visibility. So we've been looking at price book for the last few months. Prior to March 23rd, we had a number of markets in Asia which were at GSC low price to books. So I, that is extreme, and if they get back there, I will, will definitely be buying. But for right now, um, you know, valuations do not look attractive. And as you can see from the chart on the, the right-hand side, technical indicators, nothing is oversold anymore, and we're creeping very close to overbought territory. So technicals and valuation are, are a reason why I'm not um, you know, reducing my cash at this point. And then on policy response, I touched on this very briefly before, there's been 14 trillion of, of policy response um, due to COVID, but many of these fiscal measures will be withdrawn as economies open. Um, you know, we, don't, we all know about Job Seeker in Australia and there's, there's similar um, programs in, in Asia and other countries. So I think when that starts to come through and the true level of household financial stress um, becomes known, um, that could be a negative impact for, for markets. The last thing I'll highlight on this is, you know, a lot of people has has said um, that, you know, that the huge amount of policy stimulus, particularly by by the Fed, is is just a reason to buy and don't fight the Fed. That's all you need to know to to invest. And I actually strongly disagree with that sort of mentality. And I think that what's going on in developed markets creates a very strong case for why people need to be in Asia, because if you look at Japan and uh, Europe and countries that have been in QE or have unorthodox monetary policies for, for decades plus now, they're, they're not good structural growth markets. They have no structural growth. They just become trading markets. You can see the chart of the Nikkei on the left-hand side. There's been over 20, 15% moves up and down um, since Japan started QE. So they become trading markets. And I think, you know, I personally think that's a hard way to make a living. So I prefer to be in structural growth markets in Asia. And even though COVID may be a cyclical flip, um, those structural growth drivers are still in place, and um, they still have monetary policy options and fiscal options, as you can see from the chart on the right-hand side. Okay, so um, second lastly, but certainly not uh, least, is U.S.-China relations. This, this is, the, for me, the, the most puzzling thing, why markets continue to go up every day when they're, um, you know, as the presenter highlighted in the initial comments, every single day U.S.-China relations get materially worse. And Hong Kong is, is, is it, um, you know, most recently that's a big part of it. So I won't go through all these bullet points in the, in the interest of time, but we break the, the potential actions from the U.S. towards China and China's retaliation into three buckets. Macroeconomics, this is anything from trade war to Huawei, and then China responding by consumer boycotts or, or in the trade sector also. Um, foreign policy, which, you know, you can see South China, uh, South China seas or, you know, Hong Kong largely fits into, into that um, category. And then capital markets. So this is one which is probably closest to us. We do own a lot of ADR. But you may have noticed that a lot of ADRs are relisting in Hong Kong, or not relisting, a dual listing in, in Hong Kong. So there's going to be a flight out of U.S. capital markets into um, Hong Kong. And, um, you know, government bans on investing in China, which is something that we're watching, obviously, for our, for our big 
large cap China holdings. So um, the last thing I'll mention about this slide is we tried to do a slide that was similar for Australia because we are getting a lot of questions about the, the relationship between China and Australia. And frankly speaking, it looks pretty dire. The, the part of the chart that has what China could do to Australia is totally filled out. And the part of the chart that says what Australia could do to China doesn't really have anything in it. Mm -hmm. So that's just a, a comment on sort of a lot of relationships that are going on and, and souring with respect to China right now. A main point that I want to make is that EAI strategy remains the same. We are committed to high growth companies, high quality, large cap, benchmark independent, and strong ESG. You can see from the top 10 holdings on the right hand side, um, you know, those big large cap um, Asian tech companies are a very good part of our portfolio, almost 20, uh, 25%, and we remain concentrated with 53% in the top 10. In terms of country, country allocation, we do still have a preference for North Asia over Southeast Asia and India because of that, that normal epidemic curve that I showed at the beginning, um, you know, North Asia is just way ahead, both in terms of um, fighting the, the epidemic and also in terms of economic uh, reopening. And in terms of sector allocation, we have our three core sectors, which are uh, tech, financials, and consumer. Right now, the very strong preference is for tech and a little bit of consumer. Financials is actually one of the biggest underweights we've ever had in financials. That's primarily because I think COVID is going to take much longer to flow through financials than it will um, take to flow through other sectors. So that's how we're positioned right now. 